How far are the stars that we see? This is such an important question to even if you don't know the absolute answer, you should know the approximate answer. You should have a feel for about how far away they are. And there is a big difference between the halls of academics proclaiming that the stars are millions and millions of light years away. A light year being as f taking a whole year for light to travel from point A to point B, which, and it tr light travels very, very fast, and that is a very, very great distance. We are talking about very great distances, but how great is that distance? And where do you, where do they get, where do they base their um, measurements on? And we're going to get to that later. But the main thing we got to consider is, why are we listening to them? And I'm talking to both camps. I'm talking to the, the people that believe in science, so-called, and the people that believe in God, so-called. I say so-called because he's called various things. I know him as the one who inspired, authored, um, proclaimed to be true the, the Holy Bible consisting of the all 66 books now that we have in the English King James Version. And the first book, Genesis, is the book where we talk about, where he talks about his creation of the stars. And he created the stars on the fourth day. He created light on the first day. Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or Vayehi Or And the Lord God said, Let there be light, and there is light. Uh, now, that's the first day. The fourth day, he creates the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars also. By the way, he created the stars also. All of the millions and millions. See if you can tell the number of stars, he asks you. You can't. Is, he created many, 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 yes. But how far away they are, he didn't say. And can we as men, well, one thing we as men can do is ask them. Ask them. Seek and you shall find. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. So those are things we can do if we want to, and because it is important, I personally want to. And I am asking them, and I haven't resolved exactly how to measure them yet, but I'm getting there. But I think it's, I think I may never get there. But what I, what I have proposed in my mind, and I feel very comfortable with, is that they are not as far away as the halls of academia say they are. Okay, so let's uh, also go to the third day. Now, what happens on the third day? Genesis 1, 9. And God said, Let the waters under heaven be gathered together in one place. And let the dry, now land is in italics, so it's not there. Let the dry appear. And it was so. And God called the dry earth, the, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Okay, so there it is. Earth has a name now. It has a form. There are the seas that we see and the earth that we see are there. God sees it, and he sees that it is good. So we have an earth. This is the third day. On the third day, also, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed, notice the seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Right there, we're saying, 
you can take your evolution and you know it can only go so far because the ge the next generation is after first generation according to the seed instructions in the seed of what it's going to be when it grows up okay then in in verse 14 god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years so so um uh, in 16 he says and god made two great lights a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night oh by the way he made this he made this in italics oh by the way the stars also all of those millions and millions and billions of of stars by the way he made them also um and they're also in there also in there not to digress too much but let them be for let them divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons for signs and for seasons stars are grouped together in 48 ancient celestial signs called constellations. Enoch prophesied when they existed, and I believe that his prophecy is in the names of those signs and the names of the stars within the signs. It all fits together in a very, very per almost perfect picture of portraying 12 identities of the at at the time of Enoch who walked with God who talked with God who was informed by God and who was loved by God and who tra was translated this seven from Adam who prophesied to us to tell us what when he walked with God what God was telling him and I think it was telling him very sure that it was about the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he gave him 12 identities of what to look for. And I, I personally take, I look at the circle of the, of the constellations, and I start with Scorpio, which begins the season of war. It begins the season of war. Now, why do I say that? I say it because the sting of death. If you want to begin somewhere in the history of man, our beginning is really our condemnation. We began with nothing to look forward to except an end. Thus we were formed out of the earth, and thus we shall return going back into the earth. And the sting of death, the sting of the scorpion, the serpent is in that constellation group as well, began man condemned and a fight began a war began this is a season of war the next sign is an archer okay which to me is represents jesus who came to to defeat the enemy who came to speak into your hearts and make a conversion in there and make you can repent okay all of that and I don't want to digress too much, but let them be for signs and for seasons. You go on and on and on. And I spent a, a lifetime on that topic. So anybody has any questions about it, they can certainly email me if they want. Okay, but where was I? I was, I was saying that, uh, that the stars are made on the fourth day. And now, now I want to go to the fact, go into the, um, controversy i say it's a controversy because it is are they 12 are they 24 hour days that we're talking about here so the fourth day was a 24 hours um i personally do not think so and i and i'm going to bring the proof not in the fourth day which seems to be a real lot of whole bunch a lot of work but again with god of course anything is possible and he can do it all in 24 hours if he cho so chose to do it that like that but one thing we got to keep in mind and that is that god is god and who is infinity who is an infinite 
infinite in power, infinite in wisdom, and infinite in time as if there really was no time in his world. Because as soon as you have time, you want to have a beginning, you want to have an end, and really there is, is no beginning and end to God. So he is stepping out of infinite time, and he is creating time. When he said, let there be light in the first day, he already created time because it takes time for the light wave to travel from point A to point B. And that's how it is. And we are in time, and nobody can deny that. So, uh, so I'm going to say that if you look closely at Genesis 1, 25 through 31, there are, there are things that you have to say to yourself. I, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Messina, that, um, the, um, it, it probably wasn't 24 hours. And your proclamation that it was 24,000, 24,000 years sounds good to me. Now let's, let's get to how I'm saying that. Okay, verse, verse 26. God says, let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the thing, and, and over every creeping thing that uh, upon the earth. 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now this is chapter 1. You have to go to chapter 2 to get the details of that. So he is going to expand on this sentence that he makes there. Okay, so he's already expanding on, in a, in a sense of, he's expanding the time of what he's saying. He's summarizing what he's saying. Let us make man in our image after like, let, uh, and let them have dominion. So he's already got in mind that he is making male and female. Then he says, 27, male and female created he them. Now, if you're going to go to the bottom over there and say, and God saw everything that he made, behold, everything was good, and then evening and the morning was the sixth day, and say that that was included in the sixth day, all right, in the 24 hours, male and female creates he them, and you're saying that that is included in the 24 hours. The first 12 hours is darkness, light, is the, is the darkness part. And to me, nothing is created in the, in the tw first 12 hours. Everything is created in the daytime. I mean, that's the way God, God made us in his image. So if he created us to sleep in the night and work in the day, that means that that's how he did it to me. You want to argue with that? Fine. But you still only have 24 hours if you, if you want to take away 12 of it. I'm thinking, they only have, he only has 12 hours to do all of this. But I'm also thinking that he has 12,000 years to do this. Because each hour is a thousand years. Now, for, uh, first Peter, he says, a thousand years is as one day. I'm just taking it one more step. A thousand years is as one hour. And it's the same logic to God. It's like, it's like that's the way it is. Because from God to us is totally, totally different. So why can't his work week be totally, totally different than our work week? It could. And I believe very strongly, very strongly, that it is. Okay, now look at uh, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which is in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. Okay? Now, notice that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not in there. It's not even mentioned here. It's going to be mentioned in the next chapter. The details. Again, the, the details. Um, and 30, and to every beast of the earth, 
and to every fowl of the air, air and to everything that creeps upon the earth wherein, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So you see right there, verse 30, you look around, and does every beast of the earth eat herbs for meat? The lion, the crocodile, do they eat herbs right now? Was you, you can feed, now you could feed a lion a vegetation diet, and he'll live fine. But when he's in the wild, he's not going to go after I mean, he goes after other creatures to eat, not herbs, okay? That has not happened yet, and it is prophecy that it happened. In Isaiah, the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb. So he's prophesying of the time, I believe that's the millennium time, the thousand years that's coming soon. And that verse, which is in the first chapter of Genesis is, is a prophecy that has not happened yet. And it's part of his creation, creative forces in the, in the, um, in the, in the sixth day. As well as, uh, verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Which is what he told Noah more than a thousand years after he made Adam, okay? A thousand years after he made Adam, he tells that to Noah. Does he tell it to Adam too? In the very first 12-hour day to replenish the earth? It says replenish the earth. Replenish the earth that was flooded. Okay, now let's, let's look at um, the last verse, 31. God saw everything that he had made now, this is the end, this is the end of the sixth day now. He sees everything he has made, and behold, it was very good. Now, you see that extra very, it was, it was really good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. See, the evening and the morning. So, the evening starts first. The way, that's the way the Hebrew people have been doing it, and so that's probably the way it was. God's day started in the evening during that 12 hours and he had a morning and he had 12 hours of daytime where he did his work but now god god is still god here okay and he is the god who sees the future now if he's if this is the tw a 12 hour day and you're saying that he made male and female in the 12 hour day all right and he made all of the details that you see in the next chapter, we're going to get to that. God, who is God, sees everything that he made. Now, he's a, he, is the, he is the maker of prophets. He tells the prophets what to say. He, so he's the one who knows the future. He knows the heart of the man who he made. Now, right now, obviously, this, he's still, man, Adam is still, Adam and Eve are still in there. I mean, if you believe the 12 hour day thing, it's cre creating everything that you see here in 12 hours. They're in, they're in the, the, uh, their, um, innocency right now. So they're in their innocency, and you could say, okay, so they're in their innocency, and it is very good. I, I kinda like disagree with that because the God who is looking at this sees man's heart. He sees Eve's heart. At this time, I think he knows there's something wrong with the picture. And he's not going to look at it and call it good. He still has work to do on this man. And you have to agree with that. He still has work to do with this man. He still has creating work to do with this man. Molding of his image. His image is not perfect. Okay? That still has to happen, and let's go on to the next chapter. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So everything's finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. So he rested, and it's past tense. The way it's written, it's past tense. But that's from his perspective, it's past tense. 
In our perspective, it hasn't happened yet. There yet remains a rest for the people of God. Labor, therefore, that you may enter into that rest. Okay? That talks like it's a future event. Now, are you, are you gonna, are you thinking that when he rested, there was another 12 hour day, 12, a 24 hour day that he didn't do any work the next day? He doesn't do any work? Is that what you're thinking? That he, who's he resting with? He's resting with Adam and Eve. He's resting with Adam and Eve and they don't do any work. Nobody does anything and he just, everybody's happy. They didn't sin yet. Of course, you can't say that they sinned already in, in, in the 12 hour. I mean, all, all, we're going to get to the details here in this chapter. Okay, so so now God already rested. So what are we, when we labor to enter into his rest, it happened already, and it's going to happen again? He's going to rest again? Oh, he rest, uh, he, did he rest every seven days? When he was being uh, accused of working on the Sabbath, ver, uh, John five sixteen. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father works hitherto, and I work. My father works hitherto, and I work. So he's saying that on the Sabbath days for man, up until this point, hitherto, God has, God the Father has been working. Because, I mean, ox, oxen were falling into the ditch, you could say. Um, but babies were being born. I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta admit, God does a lot of work in every single baby that's born. He's creating somebody just as marvelous as you are. Every single day. Including the Sabbath. Forget about, um, circumcising on the Sabbath, he's creating the whole thing, all of it. He's breathing into the breath of life. He is not resting. That seventh day after he created, after, if you're saying that Adam was, that that was only a 24-hour tw day, that next day, that seventh day after that, that 24-hour day after that, and it was filled with plants growing and, and uh, animals that, that were being birthed and and everything that goes on, because the uh, the plants they have they they they're always multiplying. Their seeds are always germinating, and he's in, he's included in everything. He holds all things together. I mean, he the, he he has not rested yet. He has not rested yet. And this chapter, this Genesis chapter one, is a summary of everything. That's why he can conclude it with, he saw it and it was very good because he saw it after man was perfected in his image and with him in the millennium, which is included in that sixth day. Okay, now let's go back to, uh, for those of you that are not convinced yet, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, this is something I am agreeing with you that is in the first day. Now, in the first 24-hour day, I, I still don't even think that. Maybe, maybe in the first 24-hour day, maybe. But it was part of the very beginning of his sixth day of the creation week. He forms man of the dust of the ground, breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. Okay, and then he tells them, uh, I don't want you to eat of that tree, the good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. And there was talked about the four rivers, and he puts the man in the garden, uh, and he warns him again, if you eat of that tree, you shall surely die, in verse 17. Then in verse 18, he says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Okay, so if you, if you think that everything before that, before verse 18, could be in a, tw in a 12 hour day, I'm going to say 12 hour day, and you can disagree with me, but I'm going to say a 12 hour day is the days, is the time that God is working. 
And the, <coughs> the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. So he, he sees a sense of lonesome in the man. Now, does a sense of lonesomeness come in just a couple of hours? Do you, do you does the, would the man be totally lonesome just after a couple of hours? Or is that something that sets in after time, after days, months, years, lonesomeness happens? So how does he go about to solve this? Verse 19, out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Okay, now, we're going to go to the zoo. How many, how many days does it take to really see everything in, in a really big zoo, like the Bronx Zoo or San Diego Zoo? How many days do you really need to... You need days, is what I'm pointing to. You need a lot of time. And you need a lot of time. Now, you're going to say, okay, let's go see the elephants. Now, the elephants already have a name. They already have a name. But he's going to see elephants, and he, his job, you might say, although it's not a job, it's, it's for him to become familiar with the elephants and to see what's different about them that makes them peculiar and so that he can give them a name that applies just to them. And if you look at the Hebrew words for the animals, you could see that, that they are descriptive of that animal. They're descriptive names of that animal. Like we call an elephant an elephant. Now, what does elephant mean in English? An elephant doesn't mean anything in English. Now, I don't know where the name came from, but it's not a descriptive name. Tiger. It's not a descriptive. There's nothing descriptive about a tiger in the name tiger. And this, this does happen in, in Hebrew, though. You do have the description of the, of the animal in the name. Okay, now let's go to 20 now. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. So now you could take it up more and more time. You still have not gotten the help meet. What time is it, by the by, by the way, by now? Is he is Adam exhausted? Oh, he's going to go into a deep sleep soon. But what time is it? I mean, how? I'm sorry. I know God is God and He can do all things. But this is time. Adam is living in time right now. The same exact time we have. A twelve-hour day for Adam is a 12-hour day just like we have. I'm saying the creation day is different in time. It's still divided into 12 and 12, night and day. It's still divided into hours, 12 hours, but the, the hour itself is a lot longer. And it's a thousand years for each hour. Now, why do I, why am I keep saying a thousand years for each hour? Why don't I just say a thousand years for the entire day? Because, I say that because, I still think that we're not finished with the sixth day yet. And again, he looked at it and he thought that it was very good. He saw a perfected man. And he sees, and he talks about the time when uh, all, every, all the creatures eat herbs for their meat, which has not happened yet, which is a future event. So, and that's the millennium, and that's the very end. And Rosh Hashanah 2015 begins year 5901. It begins the last centennial, the last hundred years. And I say last hundred years, the last hundred years of 6,000. And 6,000 is um, fitting for the number of years of man since Adam. Since the number of man without rest is six, the number of man with rest is seven. Jesus, who was son of God and son of man, had six and seven in his numbers. 
Matthew 1, 17, for example, there are 42 generations between Abraham and Messiah. That is 6 times 7. So 6,000 is a very significant time, is a fitting time for man to be upon the earth as condemned, as a condemned man. I think that the counting begins at noontime when Adam and Eve sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned, their days were numbered. When, when it is given that, that he lived a hundred and some odd years and then he begat Seth, the beginning of that time was when he became a condemned man, when his days were numbered, when he shall surely die, as God promised him. So if we start at noontime there, then 6,000 years later, almost 6,000 years later, we're almost at the end of the day. Very, very close to the end of the day. We're very, very close to Yehoshua coming back in all his glory. It's about to, everything's about to be finished, totally finished. Pencils down, papers are gathered, and let me see the results of the test. Because we're all in a test. And we're all being tested, and we're all given the opportunity to obtain the great salvation that Jesus has given us. And that time is about to come to an end. The gospel first must be preached to all the nations. That time is also coming to an end. So that's where I get the, the, tw the 12,000 years in a day, because I'm guessing that man was condemned in the middle of the day. And 6,000 years later, his descendants are still being created and coming to the knowledge, some coming to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of God and some not. And it's the saving knowledge of God that gives you salvation and you become a perfected man and you, you live and you are resur if you're already dead, you're resurrected into the millennium, the thousand years as Revelation describes. And then, when that is all finished, and when it's all finished, and the stars roll away like a scroll rolls up, and the land disappears, and all the elements melt with a fervent heat, and the only thing you can stand on is whatever they're standing on before the great white throne judgment, as Revelation talks about. The pencils are down. The test is over. And you're facing him. That is a very, very important. That is the most important thing that you need to know, that you should fear. When you say fear God, that's the thing to fear, the fear passing that test. And you shouldn't fear too much because you are good, you're in good hands. When he said, what are the, when he, when the question was asked, what are the works we are to do? He turned to you and said, believe in me. That's what I want you to do. I want you to believe in me. I want you to trust me. I'm not doing this for nothing. When I, when the work that I, that I have done was not for nothing. It was for you. Very, 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 very precious. More precious than anything that you can attain on earth. So, Adam says, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay, so you get an idea that uh, it's time. You definitely have to agree that there's a lot of things that have to happen in that 12-hour day. Now before I conclude with this and move on, notice the first six creation days contain the phrase and the evening and the morning in genesis chapter 2 the first three verses he speaks about his seventh day of rest but here the first three verses which talk about the seventh day the rest day there is no mention of an evening and a morning why because his rest day does not include an evening. Let's take a look 
And, it, and his rest day, by the way, doesn't even include time. But let's, let's take a look at what his future rest day, as prophesied, and consists of. Revelation 22, 5. And there shall be no night there. And you've got to admit, this is future here. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. So you see there, the people are with him. Their God, our God, is giving us light. All right? There is no, there's no night there. It, can there be a night, an evening, when God is light and he's there and resting with us? So that fits, that fits not mentioning the evening and the morning. I mean, if you continue to think the way you think, and I, I can't help you. All right, let's, let's move on. Okay, so, so that means that if, if this 24,000 years in day six, there were 24,000 years in day five, so 24 and 24 are 48, and the end of day four, 48,000 years ago. Stars are still being created right now, and so there were younger stars and there were older stars, and I think I think Adam saw a lot. I I think it didn't take that long. I think Adam saw the stars when he when he was born. And I, so I don't think it even took forty eight thousand years. It took it probably took. I mean, he was probably seeing stars after twenty four thousand years. So I I think that the stars are no long, no more than twenty four thousand years away from us. Pretty soon, you're not going to see them anymore. Because the, the stars will roll up like a scroll. Now, notice the term scroll. Those are the signs and the seasons I was telling you about. The prophecy that the stars bring us in those names of their constellations and the names of their signs. Like it was a prophecy. Like it was a part of a Bible. Like it was what Job saw. Job was the, the only Bible Job had was, was what, what he saw in the stars. And he speaks of Orion, Pleiades, Apurus, and Maseroth. And there's a lot in there. And again, I have to point you to my to my videos about that, so that this video doesn't become too long. But the stars are going to roll away like a scroll. They have their their purpose. They serve their purpose. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, much much better than the one we had in the, in the past. And the one that we have now. Also, uh, an important concept that is that comes out of the way the Bible talks about stars or the heavens, uh, Psalm 104:2, "Who covers thyself in italics with light, as with a garment? Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain?" Okay. So the idea of the stars now are like a stretched out like a curtain. Isaiah forty twenty two. It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretch out stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. So now it's being compared to a curtain and a tent being stretched out like a curtain. And so a curtain has, you think of a curtain as having height and having width, but not much depth, okay? And the same thing with a tent. It has a, a, a length and a width in the material of the tent, but it doesn't have much depth, thin compared to the height and depth. Now, in Exodus 26, he describes a, cur a curtain that is going to be sort of like a model of heaven and earth when he's creating this tabernacle, when he's given the instructions to create the tabernacle. There are very similar there's similarities that lead you to believe. Now, in Exodus 26, he describes a, cur a curtain that is going to be sort of like a model of heaven and earth 
when he's creating this tabernacle, when he's given them the instructions to create the tabernacle, there are very similar there are similarities that lead you to believe he's making a model of how it is on earth and how it is in heaven. Exodus 26.1, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen. So the curtain has white in it, and it's interwound, interwound with the, the white linen, white like the clouds, okay, and blue and purple and scarlet, blue like sky, purple and scarlet like the sunsets, and the purple uh, somewhat like the night, you know, purple, um, the ultraviolet that's, that you get, with cherubims, angels, okay, of cut, so he wants pictures of angels in the curtains to get you to get you the idea that he's create he wants you to make these curtains to to be to be a similitude of of the stars and the sky and the heavens the heaven that 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 we see above the clouds and then he gives the length of a curtain and the and the width of the curtain and um and then he says, and every one of the curtains shall have one measure, you know, the measure of, of the width of your hand, span. And it should be like an ample, in other words, a good size measure. So I'm thinking that it's a very, very thick curtain, okay? But it's not, it's, it's not as long as the way the academics describes the, the depth of the, of the universe is that it goes on and on and on and on. But, that's really not the way it's described here. It's described here like it, the height of it is much greater than the depth of it, okay? And the height and the width of it are much greater than the depth. The depth is thick, but it's not that thick. It's, it's a curtain. It's not, it's not a, a raisin bread, okay? It's expanding in, in the sense that it's stretched out, but it's not going too far out. It's not going too far deep. I mean, when you when you stretch out a curtain, you stretch it from one side to the other side. You don't stretch it into the window and then into the rest of the room. You, you don't give it an expanse. It doesn't have an expanse into the room. So I don't think they're that thick. I mean, therefore, when you measure one that you can measure with parallax, we'll get to that, one that you can measure with parallax, that's the, the rest of them aren't that much further away from that. And the ones that you can measure with parallax are only a few thousand light years away. Okay, now, there are a lot of educated scientific Christians that are in the field of physics and astronomy and science that have grappled with this problem that I'm, I'm facing myself. Now, one of them is Dr. Russell Humphreys, uh, who used to be uh, an atheist used to believe in evolution and uh, was persuaded otherwise uh, and became a Christian and now wants to view the Bible, uh, wants to view the universe as according, as it is written in the Bible, like myself. Now, he, he mentioned a few things I disagree with. I mean, he thinks that each six, each of the seven days are literally... 24-hour days, and as a matter of fact, he even says in his in the video um, interview that the Earth spins in exactly 24 hours, and that the Earth orbits the Sun in exactly 365 days. There we ha therefore we have the the signs and the seasons and the days and the years uh, as it indica as, as indicated in Genesis, um, and, but. He says that God said the earth spins, and God doesn't, has never said that. That's number one. He said the earth orbits the sun. God never said that. Okay, so there's two premises that, that I, I think he's wrong on. His reasoning, if the star is millions and millions of years away, light years away, his reasoning that it gets to the earth very quickly is because... Uh, and then he points to Einstein's general theory of relativity, and he looks at the equation, and he sees a, a, a gravitational potential that has an effect on the the time, 
that it has an effect on time. Okay, it shortens the the um, the higher the gravitational potential, the shorter the shorter the time. Uh, so, and he explains a an atomic clock uh, that is put uh, you know at a very high altitude. An atomic clock, clock at a at a lower altitude, and comparatively, they have uh, all. Although it's very, very, very slight, and to even notice anything, you really got to go over, go go over a, a year, maybe two, <clears throat> to notice even a maybe even a fraction of a second difference. But he says, uh, you know, but a fraction of you know over time. You know, that makes a big difference, is what he says. As far as the observing the clock in the heavier gravitational field and the clock that is above and in, the, in a lighter gravitational field, less pull of gravity, I think that um, the atomic clock itself may be, may be functioning just a slight difference, and it is a very, very, very slight difference. But I think the heavier gravity, the heavier pull on the one at the lower altitude is affecting the oscillation state from the higher to the lower uh, energy levels that the cesium, the, in, inherent in the cesium clock, um, there, are, there are these, you know, the, uh, the oscillations go from higher states to lower states and then back and forth again. And, and those, those, uh, oscillation ticks are, are, are measured, okay? And it has a certain frequency and a frequency is measured. And when, this, when the count is, is a certain amount of count, as the counter and reaches a certain count of oscillations, then you have a second. And like I said, I think that just because you're in a, in a heavier gravitational field, you may be getting less excited, less excitement to the upper levels, and therefore less excitement to the lower levels, even though it's just a very, very slight, slight, slight difference. And so I don't think it's affecting time as we know it. It's just affecting the time of the atomic clock. And let's talk about parallax in a sense right now. Parallax, the way they measure the stars in parallax, so they're assuming that the Earth orbits around the sun in a year. It orbits around the sun in a year. And it needs, it needs that length from Earth to Sun doubled to get a, a nice, big, broad base width. So when they have the angles in the parallax calculations that they have, they can have a good size distance, which is the Earth from the Sun. However, I, I firmly believe the Earth does not orbit around the Sun, nor does the Earth spin on its axis for 24 hours each day. And so it's getting known now. People are getting to know, people like me are getting to know and be, um, are being convinced that the Earth does not orbit the Sun. And so you really can't use that distance that you use because diameter of the, the Earth is not enough distance. You can't really, you can't really use it to, to measure something far away just using the diameter of the Earth. Now, you have the, uh, the satellite Hippar Hipparchos that supposedly measured distances of the, of the stars getting more accurate using a parallax of going around this, orbiting the sun and getting even a further diameter out and therefore making it more accurate and seeing, seeing a lot more stars. And I don't know. I mean, the, the government tries to suppress the truth, and the government is trying to keep the millions and millions of ye light years away because the government does not want to tell the truth, just like Satan is a liar and the father of lies. That's, that's what he does. You cannot believe anything Satan says. This particular con uh, controversy of how far away they are. If you're going to say they're millions and millions of light years away, then guess what? The Bible is going to be wrong. And if the Bible is going to be wrong, 
now you've already put in a distrust on the Bible. So they will not, they will not come out with data and hand it to you and say, yeah, you're right, look, we just put, sent Hippocrates up there, and guess what, we, we can't measure anything too much further than 4,000 years, 5,000 years, uh, uh, light years. So in other words, whatever they say, I, I, can't, I cannot trust. I don't believe it. So I can't even look at their data. I don't believe it. I don't believe them. This whole thing about the geocentric Earth, that it stands still in the center of the universe, just don't forget, he created on the third day the Earth. On the fourth day, he creates the stars. So they're already there. The Earth is already there. He's creating the stars around the Earth as if it was the center. But they're telling you we're just a random planet on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy and there are millions and millions of galaxies just like it, and we're somewhere out there, and we evolve, we orbit the sun, and the sun is just an ordinary star, and as far as the safe, the habitable zone, Earth happens to be in a habitable zone, because, because it has to be just right, it has to be just right for uh, life to exist on it. But there's millions and millions of habitable zones out there, planets that have ab habitable zones that orbit around their own sun, and there's plenty, and we, we, are, we are just one of many. And that's not what the Bible says. The way it's written is, the, heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. So... The Earth is not a random thing. It's, it's, it's his footstool. There's no other planet that's his footstool. We, our Earth is his footstool. It is where he put his two feet when he became flesh. He walked on this Earth. Okay? And the whole idea of the tabernacle is that man lives on one side of the, of the, of the curtain that has the cherubims and has the, has the colors of the sky, and God lives on the other side, where only the high priest can come in one a, once a year. Right now, the high priest, son of man, is seated next to the Father, and God is spirit, and the son of man is flesh, and, has, and, has, and sits at his right hand. As our high priest as the one that is our advocate, as our lawyer, as the one that pleads for us, uh, who knows what we do, why we do it, because he, he experienced everything we experience. So we're not a random planet. We are special, the Earth. He called, he gave us, an, he gave our planet a name, Earth, okay? And he says, it's my footstool. He rests his feet on, on our earth. He has walked on our earth. He has risen from our earth. He will come back to our earth. And it's the people on the earth that he's most, most concerned of. He's concerned about us. We're just not just a happening. We are special. Dr. Humphreys has a, a colleague, Dr. Jason Lyle, Excellent. His video, you, you, I, I highly recommend watching his videos. He's very informative. He gives a good pre presentation. I've shared a few of his vi videos already. Um, but uh, he had a uh, debate with Dr. Hugh Ross, who is also claims he's Christian, but he gives, he gives an explanation very, very secular. Uh, and that's what this debate was about. Um, Dr. Jason Lyle um, standing on the ground that uh, they are the creation week consisted of six 24-hour days, just like we have now, um, which I disagree with that right there. Um, but um, there were a couple of other things that I disagreed with. Um, one was he gave a few examples of what 
uh, Christians like myself have been putting forward. And one of the, th one, the very first one he mentions is that the, the stars are not as far as w away as they say they are, which is what I fully agree with. Uh, but he, he doesn't explain it at all. He just brushes this one, th this away as these guys are wrong. Science does know what they're doing. We're right about this. And, and that is not the reason. They really are as far away as they say they are. I re would like to see a video just explaining that. Because uh, all of the research I've been doing, I don't see it. I don't see uh, any explanation of why the, the only thing... The only thing I can see is that they are basing the distances away using this redshift anomaly, okay? Using the redshift, it's not an anomaly, it's a, it's, a, it's a visual thing that you see, you record, it has a number. It's not an anomaly, it's, it's out there. Let's go over to Jude, we'll start at verse 6. And the angels, which kept their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So remember the, the curtain, the, the thick curtain that is representative of, of the stars and the sky and the heavens of the tabernacle? Uh, it, it was, it, they, he was, they were told to put cherubims uh, into that curtain. And the angels, which um, again rep can represent the stars as well, I mean they're, not, they're all not the stars. It, it, the stars are, are um, represent the people of Israel as well at one point. So it's so people and angels and, and angels are all about us and God is go re going to remind us that the angels are up there the way uh, fowls of the heaven uh, fly about, so do the angels fly about us. And there are angels that keep their own habitation and stay where they're supposed to be. And verse 6 says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. They left where they were supposed to be, and he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Now, angels cannot be redeemed. Let's go down to um, verse 11. Woe unto them. Now, now these, these are people that, that leave, their, that leave the, the faith. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Corey. So there were three examples of, of leaving uh, your faith for something else, and there are three good examples right there. Twelve, these are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit with wither, withers, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So when we see like the wandering stars in the sky, like like the planets wander, Mercury, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, all those stars, one wander in the in the sky he's referring to them as as what they shouldn't be doing all right so this is telling me that the stars are standing still in their orbit around us they're not expanding you know yes it says that he stretched out he so he did that he did that already he already stretched out the curtain the curtain's already stretched out. We're in the sixth day now. Why are they still moving? Why are they still expanding? Why is he still stretching them out? I don't think he is. 
And I don't see it in Scripture that he is. And the Scripture says, you know, in Jude, he says, the, uh, talking about planets, how they, m they move away from their position, a star moving away is like a sinner. Before I move on to the next guy, there's one more thing I want to uh, mention that I totally disagree with with Dr. Jason Lyle, and that's, uh, you know, he's believing the distances, and he still needs to come up with an explanation of how Adam and Eve, for example, can see the stars such a, in such a short time. And he, he also believes the 24-hour day, don't forget, the creation day he thinks is still 24 hours. I mean, this real, that's really a short amount of time. But because he somehow knows it's true, he also knows, like myself, that there is a reason. But I just don't like his reason. I totally don't like his reason. His reason is, in one direction, direction from the star to us, it's going, the speed of light is almost instantaneous. The other direction, going back, may be, you know, close to the speed of light or half the speed of light. What if it's half the speed of light? You know, you know, you can't really measure light. You can't measure, you know, and he starts to go into a, um, a very vague area that that is not true. That can't be true. I mean, Doc, Dr. Lyle, do you believe that yourself, that in one direction, the speed of light is almost instantaneous, but not the other? Uh, what about the stars on the other side of the universe? I mean, they're coming from that other direction, I, 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 and they and they they they're so called millions and millions of miles, light years away. So your argument, it you know, doesn't hold. It's, it doesn't make sense. Most people don't believe that. And the, the pro, you got to look. I, I beg of you to look into how they're coming up with how far away the stars are. What is their logic? Don't forget, they're like Dr. Ross, thinking that God, that the Big Bang and God are, do things the same way. Now, the Big Bang doesn't sh first have light a whole day, creating just light, the whole day, creating the heaven, dividing the waters. Does the Big Bang have anything to do with that? When you see the timeline of the Big Bang, does it show you that? No. The Big Bang and creation uh, don't agree with each other at all. At all. One of us is right, and we know who's right. Because we know God. We know he's true. We know we have the joy in our hearts that he's coming. All right. Uh, anyway, look into that. And then do a, do a video. Show me. I mean, it's got to be a lot, lot more than just, uh, we're, we're scientists and we already, we know better. And that, that, that's a true statement. They are millions and millions of years away. Prove it to me. Show me. Make me, make me look at your video and say, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. Since I, uh, mentioned, uh, Dr. Hugh Ross in, in his debate with Dr. Jason Lyle, um, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I agree with Dr. Ross in that, and, and I had already formulated my thoughts before I even saw that, and I did not know that Isaac Newton thought the same thing, that if you look closely at the creation of Adam, you can see, basically, that, you know, there's just way, there's just not enough time in a 12-hour day for all of that to happen. There's just not enough time for that all to happen in one day. And so, but where I disagree with Isaac Newton is he says, he makes the statement, so take as much time as you want for day one, and likewise, take as much time as you want for day two. Now, I don't know if he, I think the way that sounds to me is like, you can make day one with uh, a certain amount of time, and day two with a certain different amount of time. That's not the way days are made. Days are made with equal amounts of time, equal amounts of hours. And when you do that, there's got to be some respect for the measurement of an hour. 
the measurement of a 12-hour day, the measurement of a, of a, of a 12-hour night, the measurement of an evening and a morning. There's got to be respect for that. And I, the way I'm looking at it, I'm keeping the respect for that. I'm just saying that each hour of God's work week is, tw is a thousand years. And when you do that, and you, you go back into that, you go back into time in that work week of the sixth day, which I believe we are still in. Go back to noontime of that, of that day, of this day, go back to noontime, God's creation day, and it's, and it's when, it's about when Adam would have sinned and his days would be numbered and his 6,000 years of him and all of his descendants, including us, are condemned to surely die because that is what he said would happen if they ate of that tree. So I'm not just pulling this out of the hat. That was 6,000 years ago when he sinned. If, if he sinned 6,000 years ago, right now it's, it's almost 6,000 years are up. And he's about to come back. He is about to come back. They were saying that he's coming, his, he's coming soon 2,000 years ago. Well, it was two hours ago. He's still coming back soon. The gospel has to be preached to all nations. He's, God is fair, God is just, God is patient. But he has marked man with the number six. This is why the six thousand years of mankind is so such a significant number. So I'm not pulling these numbers out of the hat, and I don't take whatever I say. If if day six is twenty four thousand years long, evening and morning, then then day five is as well, and all of the other days. Are as well. I am. I know God to be who He is. Very, very predictable. Sometimes, sometimes. And I think time is one of those things that He's very predictable about. I agree with Dr. Ross, and then I don't agree. I don't think that you can take millions and millions of years for one of those days, for a day. You can't take. You just can't pull millions and millions, 14 million, 14 billion years out of the hat. It's not out of the hat. They have explanations and reasons why they say that. But you, you, where do you see 14? Uh, you see, I, I, I'm not even going to get into that argument. I'm not even going to go there. So I still have to struggle with uh, the fact that um, I'm being told by the authorities by the scientific community that the million that the the stars are millions and millions there are m most stars are millions and millions and millions of years away light years away now um so you Ross and I disagree with that and and uh, he made a statement about uh Einstein's general theory of relativity how it is the most proven theory that in all of science, I totally disagree with that. I don't. I don't. I, I see that as still a theory as an unproven theory. Show me the proof. All scientists in the, in his community believe it, uphold it. I just don't agree at all with that statement. Okay. Um, so the next, the next scientist that, uh, uh, Christian scientist that I see out in that field, Barry Satterfield, his reasoning to justify the millions and millions of light years of the stars, the distances that they are away, he's accepting the distances as well, which is where Barry and I disagree. Why is he accepting it? And I, and I give him the same chance to send to make a video and show us why they are that far away and what and especially note what are your assumptions okay what are your assumptions and and i know i know that he's thinking that they're still going far out they're still expanding they're still going out because and he's going by 
God stretched out the, the heavens like a curtain, which is true. And he stretched out like a tent. But once you got your tent and you're living in the tent, you're not stretching it out anymore. The same thing with your curtains. Once you hang your curtains, they're stretched out already. You got a veil between um, the the holy of holies and the and the holy place. That veil is stretched out. Once you stretch that veil out, it's it's set. It's there. It doesn't keep stretching. He stretches it out, and that's it. He's going to roll it up like a scroll. And each thing, the tent, the curtain, the scroll, they're all basically length by width dimensions. Okay, and, and you, you, you do explain it, and you're using Planck's constant and all of that, and the Planck's constant is, is intrinsic with the zero point energy. And that zero point energy is new, is new to me, because since, since I've been seeking the distances of the stars, the, the, the quest for, you know, how far away they really are, since I've been in this pursuit, I came across the zero point energy, and you were the first one, you were actually one of the first ones, although I did hear it before, I never, you know, when I, when I heard it before you, I, I said to myself, eh, because, you know, it sounds crazy. You have a, you have a glass, and this is how Barry, Dr. Barry Satterfield explained it. You have a, a jar, you suck out all of the air out of it so that there isn't a molecule in there, and you seal it up. And you look at it, and you can freeze it if you want, and you, they bring it down to the temperature almost zero. So there sh shouldn't be any energy at all in there. There should be nothing in there. And that's my, that's the way I saw it. And when somebody else said something other than that, I just dismissed it. But I, ha I have since rethought this out. There is something there. They can see it. They can measure it. They can, they can make it work. They can make it do work. They're, they're, it's in the micro world, not the, macro world it's in the micro world and in the micro world now don't forget in the micro world is inside the spaces of the atom because there's a lot of space between the nucleus of an atom and it's and it's electron that orbits a lot of space it's like it's like somebody said if the if the nucleus was the size of a basketball and you put it into the center of the Earth, the electron would be out, orbiting way out in the atmosphere. That's how much distance, relative distance, there is inside the atoms. And all of that relative distance is full of this zero-point energy that fills all space. This is probably the face of the deep, the face of the deep. Job calls it a frozen de the frozen de deep, the frozen deep. It's, it's it's really cold. It's like it's like almost absolute zero, no energy at all, no thermal energy at all. It's like it's like you're gonna freeze, man. You go out there without a jacket, you're frozen. Forget about it. You're frozen, uh, unless they don't freeze you, unless they somehow are able to go right through you. I, you see how weird it is? You see how hard it is to understand? But what it does explain to me is my all, my, uh, throughout my entire life, always wondering, not, not too much, I mean, I didn't go crazy about it, but I always wondered how the, uh, the super glue of holding the, um, Protons, which want to repel, wants to move away from each other, how, how they can stay still. Now, if the zero point energy, which has a lot of energy, a lot of microwave energy that is able to hold those protons together. There it is. There's the glue. There's the super glue. It's right there in, and it doesn't, you can't see it. There, but there is that thing that can hold it together. And what's keeping that electron from coming down into the where it's attracted to the proton? You know, it's staying in a nice 
orbit. Let's uh, read a couple of verses out of Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the part that I, the little piece that I wanted to mention here, upholding all things by the word of his power. So all things includes all of the atoms that you see in the creation. The atoms in the the atoms in the rocks, the atoms in the sea, the atoms in your hand, the atoms in your body, the atoms in your blood. They all need to be there and they're all part of his creation and they're all held, uphold by the word of his power. And I believe that word of his power is coming out of this zero point energy that inhabits all space and is involved with all creation. And it has been from the beginning and it is now. And it has, you see, the, the atoms, the, the protons in, in the atom are held together and not far away. That super glue, that super strong force that they are held by is consists of radiation or microwave or waves. Like when I'm talking now, I'm talking in sound waves. See, you see how that compares a word? He's saying he's there inside that atom and he's keeping it together. He's upholding all things every single atom that's in the world, and now he is infinite. He is infinite in wisdom and infinite in power. He's... So, so the fact that there's millions and billions and billions and billions of atoms doesn't faze him because he's infinite. And he can speak unto every one of them and say, no, 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 you stay there. You stay together because he is that superglue that nobody has ever really fully explained. And I'm starting to see where it's coming from. The zero point energy points to it. Points to the super glue that's holding all things together. It even holds the, uh, the electron in its orbit. This is at the micro, the, the mini, the nano micro. The tiny, tiny, tiny. This is at the atomic level. This all works. And the people, the scientists, the engineers, the, 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 the thrust of trying to get, because, because it's infinite energy. It doesn't need a conservation of energy. That law doesn't apply to, to, to that zero point energy. You take some out and there's still, there's still an infinite amount in there. So they're taking, they want to take some out and use it to work, use it to spin a motor, spin a generator, make electricity. And they're going to do it, even though they have to go into the nanosecond, the nanometer area, the, the, the realm of tiny, the realm of molecules. They got to go pretty, pretty, pretty small. And to get any sort of power out of a small thing like that, they got to have lots of them. So they got their work cut out for them. Um, and... I think he's, he's going to be back before, before anything really comes out of that. Of course, the people that own the oil, they don't want to give that, that power up either. Okay, um, when you, Ross, was in debate with uh, Kent Hovind, 
Because Ken Hovind has, you know, has a, a, a strong argument against the parallax method, which is admitted to be a limited, a method that is limited into only being able to see stars that are close to us. Okay? And he uh, points out the, how great that limit is. And, and to go f even further, Ken, yeah, he, he, Kent does not use the idea that we are not orbiting the Earth because the parallax method needs to have a big, uh, as big of a base as they can, a known distance for the base in, in the parallel parallax method to, um, but even, even with that distance, see, because, because, one side from, from one side of the Earth to the other side of the Earth is only, what is it, 8,000 miles, the, the diameter of the Earth? I forget. I, I don't remember. But it's not that big. It's certainly not as big as 93 million miles plus 93 million miles. So you have a gigantic, you know, the orbit of the, of the uh, if the Earth did orbit the Sun, it would have a very big, uh, from spring to fall distance. But it doesn't even have that. And so all of their measurements for, are short. All of their measurements, if they're saying we're using the diameter, you, you know, the, the whole thing is off. Everything that they've been giving you so far, as far as parallax method orbiting, you know, and then, and then they, they put up the, the Hipparchos satellite, uh, I don't know. I mean, did they really use a gigantic orbit like that and, and come up with similar numbers to what they were doing on measuring on Earth? How could that be? Okay, you're saying they, they, the Earth really does spin and we do... Show me a video, all right? You want to show me? Please, please. You have hundreds of satellites. You know, the direct TV guys, you got satellite up there. Just take a picture. Take a picture. Take a video. Not a simulation. Not, not, I don't want to see a simulation. I want to see the whole, I want to see a real time video. You can give me time lapse photography if you want. You know, where you can show the, the time in, inside each shot. So what, what time it was. And you can't fudge, you know, something you can't fudge. Show me. You, you take a satellite and you go up to, Mars, and you land on Mars, you show me the picture of the dirt on Mars, uh, and you spend millions of, of taxpayer money, but, what you know, people would, ra people would like to see a video shot of the Earth spinning, like you say it spins. Why don't you do that for us? It, that, that shouldn't cost that much. You're sending them up to Mars anyway. Take a picture. What's so hard about that? It's hard because you don't want to say the earth is at the center. You don't want to say that because it, that sort of like go and coincides with the way it is written in Genesis. The earth came before the stars, before the Milky Way. You have a round earth with land and sea and, and plants. And the earth is full of his glory and full of those that worship and praise him day and night. We're special. So anyway, getting back to Kent Hovind with his, his um, excellent argument against parallax. By the way, Kent Hovind somehow, you know, Kent Hovind doesn't really know, I mean, he, he admits that he doesn't know, and he says maybe they are millions of years ago, years uh, far away. He says, I don't know. But he knows, but he does know that the way it's written in Genesis is correct. And he ha he has to, he, he has to, like all of us, have to get in their mind how the speed of light can come if it is that far away. How, how, how it could, how it could be that that is true. If it is true, and I don't believe it is. But he, he has a, a very good uh, explanation of why the parallax method is not good. And he's saying even if you use that orbit, it, you would have a real hard time finding it. Now, 
after after all of that that he knows, he's got you, Ross, there saying we got radio, we got uh, we got radio telescopes that are uh, that can that have angles so precise. We know how far the most distant star is, and then he says how millions and millions of years ago away it is. And, and then Kent is going, what, what, excuse me, uh, yes, we have, and he, okay, now you could be telling, Mr. Ross or Dr. Ross, you could be telling me that that data has been taken and it has been verified that you have measured the furthest away star. You know how small of an angle, how small of an angle you have to have? How small the angle has to be in order to, for you to see a star so far away? I, I, you, I don't even think, I don't even think you could do it with, um, I don't even think it's a, a nano, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think you could even do it. And plus, not only that, not only that, you're, you, I'm sure you're using your, the orbit of the, of the sun too, besides. Okay, uh, uh, I'm I'm not gonna uh, continue with that. Again, I don't believe it, and show me the proof, because I'm seeking the truth of how far away the stars are, and I don't want you to tell me, well, the the blue sh the red shift says that it's going away, it's ex going away from us at such and such a speed. Yeah. Now. <clears throat> How do the halls of academia, when they say that the, the stars are millions and millions light years away, what exactly do they base that on? And one of the most predominant ways that they point to is, is evidence that is there, but they haven't really closely analyzed all of the evidence that they're pointing to they ignore many, many facts that have been pointed out to them. Now, back in the 1920 time frame, uh, astronomer uh, Edward Hubble has noticed that, that stars have in their spectrum that analyzes the elements of that star, that they all, all seem to have a red shift. Uh, associated with them, each one, and he wasn't he wasn't certain about what this was. Perhaps a Doppler shift. Take a look at uh, Halton Arp's explanation of his of what he observed, and he's not just not just one little piece. This piece of star after star after star, time and time again, he has noticed. What, what looks like the birth of a new galaxy? Okay, he's got. If you start out. You start out with this called Cyphid galaxy. This very, very active very, with with lots of uh, X rays and gamma rays and and very, very excited. A lot of energy. A lot of intense energy, electrical energy, uh, in a plasma form. Again, I didn't say again. When I when I, sh I'm not saying again because I never mentioned the Thunderbolt project. Another great, great direction of truth in science, the Thunderbolt pro project. Look into it. Okay, uh, Wallace or Wow Thornhill, a long supporting scientist of the Thunderbolts project. And this is him ta him speaking uh, concerning the book by Halton Arp, Seeing Red. Arp's contribution to the electric universe is of fundamental importance because both are based on observation and experiment instead of mathematical speculation. Arp's discovery of the quantized redshift of quasars revealed the nonsense of particle physicists who believe that quantum effects only apply to the subatomic realm. Quasars are ejected from the nucleus of an active galaxy at a good fraction of the speed of light, which implies the matter in the quasar has extremely small initial mass. The quasars then slow down to become a companion galaxy, which implies their mass increases in quantum jumps over time. 
Arp was very interested in the implications of his discoveries. He related the frequency of the red-shifted light from quasars to the youthfulness of newly created matter. He wrote in Seeing Red, The younger the electron making the orbital jump, the less massive it will be, and the weaker, that is more red-shifted, will be the emitted photon. Moreover, as the particles age, they become more massive. Therefore, the ensemble becomes more luminous. As its luminosity grows, its redshift drops, evolving into what we consider normal galaxies like our own. Also, as the assemblage ages, its growing mass slows its initial high ejection velocity in order to conserve momentum. The galaxies finish with very slow relative velocities, as observed. This is the kind of theory we are looking for. Simple, capable of being visualized. One that can connect together the puzzling observational facts that presently confound understanding. That's the end of that quote. Okay, let me see if I could um, help clarify this. Let's take a, let's go into a science laboratory and get open up the spectrum analyzer, turn it on, and we'll we'll look at the spectral lines for hydrogen. Okay, now they're gonna the spectral lines for hi hydrogen are gonna come out in. Uh, four different colors violet blue violet blue green red so you see the different colors and those colors are peculiar to the wavelengths and the wavelengths with of hydrogen have to do with the size of their orbits around the nucleus of the atom Okay, so um, there it is. You have four of them. And you see one, one is red. You see that? So just ordinary hydrogen doesn't produce just one uh, spectral line. It produces four. And those are dependent upon the energy level that it, it made its jump. So the red one... It had a small energy excitement going up. Therefore, it has a small energy excitement going down. Going down is when it emits the, 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 the photon. But all of these are photons that came out of what used to be at a more, an electron at a more excited state. And the most excited ones is the violet. The least excited ones is the red. So, Halt and Arp is saying that in its orbit about the nucleus, the electron simply did not have, was not in such a high excited state. It did not have so much energy, so much energy. Okay? And therefore, the photons that were coming out of the quasar at that time, they were not ex highly excited and they were shooting out, um, low frequencies, long wavelengths, red. Low energy, low frequency, E equals H nu, H Planck's constant, energy equals uh, a constant times the frequency. And the, so low energy, low frequency. You add more energy, you're going to get a higher frequency, which is a color shifting towards the blue. All right? So, you go into a laboratory that is, the, and the and the uh, spectrum analyzer is not moving away from you. You're gonna, still going to get uh, a line coming out that's red for hydrogen. Whatever you, whatever it's analyzing, the, those elements are going to show up in that analyzer. I'm just giving you this as an example. Okay? They all behave like this. Now, if you put the spectrum analyzer into a rocket and you had it had its own power supply and it was still able to work and it's still showing you and you took you took this very this very spectrum analyzer and you shot the rocket away from you real fast those the that violet one for example and the blue violet those would shift red towards the red be, and that would be the doppler effect but this the original the original one is not the original red one is not a Doppler shift. It's just an, an intrinsic. It's the behavior. It's the way it is in a standing still 
laboratory. All right? So it doesn't have to be moving away from us at that, that fast. It could just be when, and when you're looking at that star, their, their electrons are excited at low energies. So all it means, you're looking at stars that where their electrons are excited at low energies. It doesn't have to be moving away from you at high velocities. So quasars are shot from the heart of their parent galaxy by prodigious electromagnetic forces. Of course, mass and energy are related by the well-known equation E equals mc squared. So the mass of the galactic plasmoid at the center of the galaxy, which may be less than the size of our tiny solar system and composed of relativistic charged particles, can produce the observed gravitational effects of billions of stars. There are no black holes. The electromagnetic jet that connects the parent galaxy to its baby quasar is the umbilical cord that carries the electrical energy to increase the mass of its embryonic galaxy over time. Should we be surprised that Arp's view of the cosmos has almost biological overtones? In the final paragraphs of Quasar's Redshifts and Controversies, we see the measure of a real scientist, as Arp writes of his thoughts on matter generation in active galactic nuclei and quantized redshift. It is still just a working hypothesis, to be discarded or modified as further observations are made to test it. In fact, its major usefulness is probably only to promote further observations. Yet always the hope is that we have achieved some fuller, deeper understanding of the universe we live in. End of quote. The electric universe acknowledges the brilliance and courage of Helton Arp. Like Galileo, his contribution to science will be acknowledged for all time. Low redshift galaxies are often found connected to high redshift companions. Clearly, most of the redshift is intrinsic to the companions. At a single stroke, Arp removed the foundation for Big Bang cosmology. He had, in fact, proven Edwin Hubble, his mentor, correct. For Hubble had written in the Royal Astronomical Society monthly notices in 1937, and I quote, If the redshifts are a Doppler shift, the observations as they stand lead to the anomaly of a closed universe, curiously small and dense, and it may be added, suspiciously young. On the other hand, if redshifts are not Doppler effects, these anomalies disappear and the region observed appears as a small, homogeneous, but insignificant portion of the universe extended indefinitely both in space and time. End of quote. The irony is that the constant defining the hypothetical rate of expansion of the universe bears Hubble's name. The winners rewrite history. Arp proved Hubble right. We live in a universe extended indefinitely both in space and time. Walt Thornhill, by the way, from Australia, um, excellent, right on most of the time, I know almost all the time. This is one point where I, I tend to disagree with him, and I agree with him, but disagree with him. Now, well, let's, let me just go over that again. If the redshifts, this is Edwin Hubbard now, if the redshifts are a Doppler shift, now the observations as they stand lead to the anomaly of a closed universe. Curiously small and dense, and it may be added suspiciously young. It almost looks like Hubble's quotation is misquoted, because it's almost as if he said, he was saying, if the redshifts are not a Doppler shift, if the redshifts are not a Doppler shift, then it's just the opposite of what the Big Bang is saying, and therefore the observations as they stand lead to the anomaly of a closed universe, curiously small and dense, and it may be added suspiciously, suspiciously young, which is what I agree with. So if you put the word not in there, which is what I also agree with, that they are not a Doppler shift, then you come to this conclusion of what I have, that, the, that uh, it's closed, small, dense, and young.